Welcome back to another episode of the Answer Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo. And as always, it's an honor to, to bring your stories of leadership, perseverance, and service from the members of our naval community. Today, Today's episode is proudly sponsored by Navy Mutual, um, a trust partner for military families providing life insurance and financial security for over 140 years. Thank you, Navy Mutual, for supporting this platform and empowering us to amplify the voices of our Naval Services members. Before we dive in into today's special uh, episode, um, let's talk about an event that or not to want to miss, the Answer Western Region Leadership uh, Symposium happening December the 2nd to the 6th, 2024 at MCAS Miramar San Diego in California. This event uh, will bring, you, bring together dynamic guests speakers, engaging breakout sections, networking opportunities, professional development workshops, and, and more. Hosted by the ANSO and ANSO San Diego chapter, the symposium is your chance to connect, grow, and lead. Head to www.ansomail.org for more information and secure your spot. Before we dive in, in this conversation, I want to make a quick disclaimer. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participant and do not reflect the official policy of position of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, or any other government entity. Now, today we we, we honor to welcome HM2 Alexa Valerio to the podcast. HM2 Valerio has an incredible journey that embodies leadership, resilience, and a deep commitment to service. From her diverse medical roles to her extraordinary contribution during deployments and her work as a community leader with ANSO, her story is nothing short of inspiring. Let's dive into, into your journey and explore the milestones that have shaped her career. HM2 Valerio, Alexa, welcome to the ANSO podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you so today? much. <laughs> um, I'm doing great. It's, I just want to say it's so like great to be here. It's such an honor and thank you for having me. Yeah, and no, I appreciate it. Thanks. I know Colonel Montalban, um, President Anso El Presidente, he, he actually wanted you to be in the podcast. And again, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Um, now, let's start from the beginning. Like, I know I was looking to your bio and you were growing as a Navy brat and moving around a lot. And then how those experiences actually shape your perspective and service and ultimately inspire you to join the Navy? Um, so actually growing up a Navy brat, mm -hmm. I was the family member that was never wanted to join. Okay. I didn't ever <laughs> want to join the military. Wow. I, I was a theater kid. I, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but moving around a lot, we got stationed in England and that was my senior year. I kind of moved back to Virginia, had a little gap, I'm sorry, gap year, and I was sitting in community college <laughs> taking chemistry, and I was like, I hate my life. I hate chemistry. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I want to do. And so right then and there, my dad kind of started playing around, like using his like Navy experience, trying to push me <laughs> to go, and I... I just, I just bit the bullet. I kind of just joined <laughs> yeah. and I didn't want to be a corpsman actually. That wasn't mm -hmm. my original one. I wanted to go be an IS, um, but they just didn't have the option open for me. So my aunt was a corpsman and she kind of sold the idea for me. So that's how I kind of got into it. Medicine was never like <laughs> an interest to me. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah, and then uh, yeah, and when you you joined back in twenty eighteen, that's when you joined. Yeah, I twenty eighteen. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, you, I seen your brother that you graduated in the top ten of your class uh, at A school. What motivated motivated you to push yourself to achieve excellence in that motivation right there? Oh, I actually um, I didn't find out I was technically in the top ten until my instructors pulled me aside and said, "Hey, like." I just want to show you, like, you made so much improvement because I was that kid in A school that failed back-to-back -back tests, and I discovered then that I had test anxiety. I never knew I had test anxiety. I knew I had anxiety, but <laughs> not when taking tests. So my instructors, they actually put me through, like, this army call it, like, course, um, 
and like I missed a couple hours out of this one day of school and they put me through it and I learned how to properly take notes, how to calm myself down before an exam. And as soon as I went through that class and I had really good friends in a school that helped me um, study, the next test we had was cardio and I got a hundred. And <laughs> after nice. that, I, I, I like, I, bow I bounced back and I, I didn't, I had straight A's throughout this stuff. So, um, it kind of, what really motivated me was not failing. I didn't want to be that kid that failed out of core school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that didn't want to be, I didn't want to be that. Um, so, but also having really, really good instructors and really like amazing friends that I still talk to this day, helping me. Oh, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing actually that you, you were able to pull that off. Um, I'm an I'm instructor myself uh, right now here at Fort Gray Adams. It used to be for Lee before, um, for the logistics captains here at, at the Army. And I, believe it or not, there's a lot of uh, students, they have text anxiety, and they didn't know until they actually started getting testing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I feel you. <laughs> and military tests, they are so different than college tests. So Like, yeah. so different than, like, what you do in high school. So it's... It's so different. And we, unfortunately, in the military, we get, like, taught how to... Um, I guess like data dump. So like put so much knowledge in our head and then dump it right after. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was just like the whole thing I was trying to understand. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. I, I agree with what you said because like we, we dump a lot of stuff in your head and it's like after that, after you're completely in testing, move on for the next task and that's it. <laughs> no, uh, no. Yeah, I know. I know. But believe me, I'm instructing myself. <laughs> so I know. Uh, that's fun. Uh, fun to hear. Now, um, after you finish like, your A school and court, so you have your first assignment at the U.S. Naval Hospital, Hospital One, right? Yes. So how was that for you? So now you are now in the Navy. Now you're going to your first duty assignment. How, how was it for you? <laughs> um, I think I was 20 years old and I went to an island thousands and thousands of miles away. <laughs> miles <from> away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. And I did have an adjustment period. A lot of a lot of new sailors do, and it's not really talked about as much. But when you're so young, and you've never had a real—I mean, I had a lot of jobs that I did before. But um, a lot of high school students going straight through the military—they don't really have like a a job before, or they don't have—they've never been away from parents. They've never been away from home. Um, and I, I'm a very like close knit family person. So being so far away from home, it did strike a nerve with me. I was really like sad a little bit. Um, but luckily I, you know, Naval Hospital Guam is so busy. It's the only ER on the island and I was able to work a lot <laughs> um, okay. to, yeah. to try to be distracted from like everything around. But then I also did a lot of growing up there. Um, I learned so much from my job. If I have, if there's anybody in core school right now or junior corpsman, mm -hmm. go to Guam. That is the best place to get on job training experience. You are going to learn the most in your career from there. Um, I learned so much there and I, I was one of those people that got bounced all around the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I were, I was lucky that I worked, had my inpatient experience, I had ER experience, I had outpatient, um, and then I was able to learn, like, what niches of medicine that I do like, and I, I learned so much from there, and then the island was amazing, mm -hmm. love the island, I love the people there, they were so welcoming, there was just, it, like, all, I miss ha uh, working there because at least, like, patients would bring, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, rather than, like, ice comments or, like, saying good stuff, they would oh, just, like, out of the goodness of their hearts, bring you, like, um, bananas and avocados from their trees <laughs> <laughs> or, or, like, wow. oh, man. And, I, and it's so funny. I have a coworker that I work with now, and he was stationed with me in Guam, and we always talk about that. <laughs> like, dang, I really wish we had a patient that would bring us in some food <laughs> or stuff like that. Um, but I, I loved it. It was such a good, it was a, it's, it was an amazing experience. No, I, I believe like hearing you, I think you have fun. And then you were able to travel, uh, in Guam, like to, to the region. So unfortunately, the... um, I tried to do it two times. So I tried to go to the Philippines, dengue fever broke out. So I had to cancel my entire trip. 
And then I tried to plan a trip to Thailand Mm -hmm. and COVID (laughs) broke out. (laughs) So, and then with COVID, uh, that was probably like the worst experience on the island just because of the, no one knew what was happening Mm -hmm. in the world with COVID. Mm -hmm. So like, we were all trying to figure out everything Mm -hmm. and then the burnout and then just, and then we had, I worked with the Theodore Roosevelt too with that stuff. So it was just like a whole try to figure out <laughs> what's going on type of situation. But overall, yeah, I unfortunately didn't do get to do a lot of traveling, but I wish I did. No, yeah. And then that was my next question because uh, you were uh, on on that, uh, on Guam during the COVID-19. So can you actually uh, share with us, like, how was that COVID-19 for you uh, being in the hospital? Because uh, you said, like, nobody knew what's going on. Like, it was a chaos. And I believe, like, that happened also. Can you share some of the experiences, like, and how you overcame some of those challenges during COVID-19? So during COVID-19, I was an E3, um, still trying to learn my job, still trying to understand everything. Um, But when that happened, everyone was trying to figure out Mm -hmm. their job Mm -hmm. and their placement for that. And it started off really small. Like we were just focusing on the island and we had it, we actually had it very well maintained where we could um, open up uh restrictions a little bit so like Mm -hmm. we were able to go it was actually my 21st birthday they were able to open up and clear us to go back to restaurants Mm -hmm. and stuff and so that was really exciting um we were able to do that but then the theodore roosevelt pulled in and i think it, it may have been march or april around that time i'm really like rough with the time span but as soon as they pulled in, they closed all, like, our restrictions went back, <laughs> to, like, mm-hmm. uh, like full force. So, but with that one, we ended up having to use all of, like, 75% of Naval Hospital Guam employees to go and support all of the hotels, all of the quarantine spots that we were doing for them, um, the ship itself we were assisting. Um, my role in that aspect was... Um, both my LPO, my ALPO, my work center soup, they were gone. So I had to, because they were supporting it. So I had to step up in a role of LPO. And <laughs> I had just hit my one year in the Navy <laughs> mark. So I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of like stepped up in that role for a cup for about a month. And Till everybody got back. And I remember when they all came back, I was like, thank God. <laughs> I have no, <laughs> this, I'm just happy the place didn't burn down. <laughs> um, but luckily I was able to do a lot of that stuff because of my, um, I had a really good HM1 there, like telling me what to do, like being like, okay, just make sure this gets done, make sure that. And so I was like, okay, this is easy. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah that's fun times i mean it was fun times for everyone during covid 19 right so <laughs> I, oh my god i remember that, i remember yeah that. i i learned really hard how hard it was to um lead over your peers mm. so <laughs> that's that was really <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's amazing to hear that um now after guam then you moved to the uss harry truman right yes and then you took multiple leadership roles, including the female wellness coordinator at T Triple C instructor. How these roles actually are starting to shape you as a leader, and what was your proudest accomplish accomplishment during this time? Um, so my proudest accomplishment in the Truman was honestly when I got my Surface Warfare device. So. In the Navy, we got away from, um, we put like a rank requirement on getting warfare devices now, especially in ships. So you have to be an E5 or above or an E4 with an EP um, to qualify to get one. So I was an E3. And so I worked so hard to get all of my quals in this time span just so I can beat the, like, the time period where they were going to shift. So I, I stayed late. I, I worked so hard on my duty days. I would stay later on off hours just to try to get things like my books signed off, to get qualified to take the tests, do all of that stuff. 
I like went to all the boards and I, I hate public speaking. <laughs> so I have to like <laughs> really do. learn. You, I, you do, do. I genuinely you do. Just, you're doing some well right now, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> For somebody that hates it. Oh, uh, we had to work. I had to work a lot through this. This is like <laughs> this is after three practice rounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so I had to like learn to get over that and be able to sit there and speak through all these boards. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, when I got my warfare device, that was the proudest moment for me. Mm. And I remember getting so happy. So that one was my my biggest achievement. That and making E four. Um, I worked. Okay. It was a four year. E3. Um, and I ended up my for all the Navy folk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, both times this has happened in my career. So where my advancement worksheet was messed up, so my name didn't get called when I picked up E4. So I had to go and send it to Big Navy and fix my worksheet and then get my, mm -hmm. all my yeah. So I had to wait for like over six months, like eight months to get E4. <laughs> Oh, wow. But I knew I had picked up for it, and I was so mm -hmm. upset. Like, why can't I just wear it? Like, I, I, I literally picked up. Everybody agrees with it. So, can I please just wear it? Um, but they're like, no. My ESO at the time, she, I don't know, she wasn't about it. So, um, when I finally got the go ahead to get pinned and wear my rank, mm -hmm. I, I full blown boohoo cried. <laughs> Like, I was crying. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, because I worked so hard for it. Right, I, right, like, right. I had gotten all the quals. I had worked. I did everything. Um, passed my PRTs. Did did everything. And so when I finally got that, I, I was like, yes, I got it. That's a big, a huge accomplishment right there, right? So it feels mm -hmm. like a, a comp you're, you're pretty complete because you're working for this. And then, like, it took so long to, to actually pin you. And then, like, oh my gosh. it felt nice, right? Yes. And then to be four years is the lowest ranking in my department, even though I had more quals than some mm -hmm. E6s at the time. And I had more responsibilities than certain, mm -hmm. like, E5s and stuff. I was, I was, I just felt so cheated for so long of that like time there mm -hmm. so when i finally got it i was like yes <laughs> i got, <laughs> I got what i worked for <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i'm glad that everything worked out for you at that time right because again that's why you why why we join because we want to progress i mean we, we're proud to our jobs and, and what we do in, within our ranks now uh, so so can you speak on what was your role as a female wellness co coordinator um in that time so i was in charge of making sure female readiness so mm -hmm. pap smears gcs um a lot of women don't know from ages 18 to 27 you are annually required to get a mm. gc swab gonorrhea chlamydia testing no matter what mm -hmm. um but your pap smears, making sure mammos are done, uh, birth control. I like any female related health thing. Mm -hmm. That was me. Okay. <laughs> I, it, all, it all went towards me. And then I had numbers and QAs and I would send it up. And if it was a medical readiness requirement for it, um, I was a big part of like assisting with that because mm -hmm. I would book all the appointments to get our numbers up for the ship. Um, and then I did that not with just ship's company. I did it with the squadrons and I did it with the strike group and Desron. Mm. That was okay. totally a part of our deployment. Um, it was really tough. Mm. <laughs> a lot of the times we had um, two male providers. So it all just went to me <laughs> and then mm. I would work with them on doing stuff um and so i had a female idc and a female smo come in um and then mm -hmm. the female idc that came in h1 homes she actually did like the most mentoring with me for all of this because she'd been doing playing doing the role mm -hmm. a lot longer than i have in her career so it was um and so it was another um the person who turned over with me um an hm2 She's an HM1 now, HM1 Nimez. They both like assisted me with that. Cause as like a little E3, like you don't <laughs> you don't know how to write SOPs, you don't know how to write memorandums, all that stuff. So having them both there assisting with me and then teaching me how to lead and how to hold that role and you know, stand on business with that role because 
I don't, I don't know about you and like the army, <laughs> but a lot of like if anybody that's a higher ranking than an E3 and you're holding mm. this E6 position, you kind of have to stand your ground when you're talking to officers or E6 right. and be like, actually, you, you need to make sure your people come in so mm-hmm. we can get them medically ready. Yeah. So it was a whole a lot, a lot of um, learning how to be tactful with that role. No, most definitely. Like, there's no no big difference between uh, branches as far as ranking and then how to address and, and, and know what you're doing, but especially when you're like a junior enlisted or junior officer, you know, too. Uh, but it's good that you have your mentor network that help you out to actually understand the SOPs, you know, how to do the memos, how to even write an email, right? So an email, which is a small thing that... You have to pay attention. And I still, and I still right. struggle with emails. Honestly, <laughs> I have to ask. That's why right. I'll, I'll, my biggest, big uh, piece of advice for the emails: use Grammarly. <laughs> Grammarly, <laughs> you know, the Grammarly, the app is free, and even me, I just run all my emails and structures through Grammarly because, again, that's the first impression. I mean, I might know Alexa, uh, who, who she is. Uh, let's say. But if I don't know you and you send me an email and then it's like a gram- grammatical errors all across and it doesn't make sense, you know, it's the first impression matters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it do matters. And then also <laughs> like struggling with like the fine line of being direct, but not too mm-hmm. direct. And right. then like, cause I know sometimes um, right now in my position, I'll get emails from like higher officers, like mm-hmm. 06 and above. And then, I'm just like, why are you screaming at me? <laughs> like, why yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I just I just told you what you needed to do? <laughs> um, but then I'll usually call them, and they are the nicest people. Yeah, the- yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, okay, it's it's their email. <laughs> That's yeah, it it, no, that, that happens over text too, right? So sometimes mm-hmm. like. You need to know, like, when you text somebody, you don't know, like, what's the emotions behind the text, and you're like, oh, my God, what's happening? And then when you talk, it's like, okay, no, it's not that bad. (laughs) Same with emails. (laughs) Uh, That's crazy, Um, but good to hear. Now, you actually went to deployment in the Mediterranean Sea, and you have involved in the NATO operation during the Ukraine crisis, which are pivotal, pivotal moments. Can you share what it was like to serve in a such high pressure, fast paced environment during that? I honestly have, you know, I've watched some of these podcasts before, like the podcast here and everything with YouTube, and yeah. people get so serious talking about the deployment and stuff. Mm-hmm. I had nothing but fun <laughs> on that okay. deployment. Fair. Um, I learned a lot about myself and I learned mm-hmm. a lot about. My coworkers, I learned a lot about how people operate under high stress, um, who can, who sinks and who swims. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people are just like amazing at high, like working in high stress. And some people are just like, you you gotta help them. You gotta carry your friend with you. Um, For me, I learned that I I thrive. (laughs) I thrive under high stress environments. I enjoy the high speed, low drag lifestyle. I I just had so much fun on deployment. I think what I did that made it easier for me was I got, well, I got literally all my qualifications before we mm-hmm. sent out and deployed. So that way I wasn't working. I wasn't constantly busy. I really only had to do my job, my collaterals, uh, the programs I did, and then maintenance. And then I would stand watch for the flight deck. And after that, I had time to work out. I had time to read my thousands of books that I brought and downloaded mm-hmm. on my Kindle. Um, <laughs> and just like go, there was always activities to do on the ship too. I was on a carrier, so a big deck, um, which there's a lot of MWR stuff. A lot of people, a lot of commu- uh, associations, committees, they're mm-hmm. always putting on functions. So there's always something to do. So that way you don't sit in your rack all day or you don't isolate yourself. You can go out and meet people. So Mm -hmm. I would always leave my department because the thing about deployments on a ship is if you stay in your department with the same people all day, you start having that 
toxic family dynamic where you start uh, thinking, I start you start talking to me like my brother does and then I start talking to you how I talk to him and it gets it gets messy so one thing I learned I, I left I left my department and I went to other departments I went to go talk to other friends out there mm-hmm. I learned things I got extra qualifications from just meeting people um that helped me with my evals and stuff so that's I uh, as for the actual operations, <laughs> mm-hmm. I did not like I couldn't tell you a thousand things that happened on during that deployment yeah, right. because I just worked through medical. Mm-hmm. On the medical standpoint, we did a lot of we had a lot of med- medevacs. So I one of my first medevacs I did. Um, so one thing about me is I'm terrified of heights. I, I, I'm so scared of them. <laughs> So, but my SMO, she was like, I want you to go medevac this person. So you're going to fly on a kilo and you're going to fly back over there. They're going to come, they're, they're going to come to the ship and then they're going to evac somebody from the ship to shore. Oh, wash yes. Over. Yes. Okay. So I did that. I transported a patient over and that was kind of like, it was a really cool experience. I had my Top Gun moment. Okay, like <laughs> I, I was in a helo. It was great with the headset, no. with the headset and everything. <laughs> yeah, but just know I was freaking out, mm. scared. <laughs> I was trying to play it cool for the patient, <laughs> but I was <laughs> almost about to start using the oxygen tank on myself. <laughs> um, so that was really cool. Medical wise, we did a lot of medevacs, so I saw a lot of like traumatic patient right. care moments um that i don't think i would be able to see anywhere else i learned a lot how to do my job i learned effectively like w- the ins and outs of a trauma evolution and a trauma uh how to kind of lead that trauma bay mm-hmm. so whenever we have we would have like a short fuse medical emergency like i i learned to be the person like hey you're going to go on comms you're going to be here you're going to be there I learned how to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned how to do a lot of medicine on my own, obviously, with a provider next to me. But (laughs) I learned how to do a lot and how to treat. And I learned a lot of things. Um, And I learned a lot about myself that I overall just... It's it's not even that I enjoy being a corpsman, that I just enjoy Mm -hmm. being a sailor. And I loved being on a ship. That was probably my favorite tour. That will probably always be my favorite tour because I had I met the best bestest of friends and then I met the the best mentors I've ever had that I still talk to right. today, literally yesterday. Talk to one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so so for those that listen listening, so can you uh, explain a briefly synopsis? And I know you you mentioned it, but like what's a day to day on the ship when you're a deployment? How long is a deployment usually on a ship? For those like actually don't know anything about being a ship or, or deployed, uh, typically, and then like, what's your day to day? Like, hey, you wake up, you do PT, and then you're, you're like literally in a ship doing X amount of months. For those like don't know so much about it, um, so I can only speak for on a medical behalf, um, mm-hmm. and this is only on a carrier. Well, the carrier that I was, because I'm not sure mm-hmm. how other carriers work, um, so. Basically, we have a schedule. So wake up zero, no, muster at zero seven zero seven thirty. Um, we have our family muster. Everyone's there. Accountability. Um, then we do cleaning stations. So Mm -hmm. sweeper sweepers, Mm -hmm. right? We clean all of our spaces from zero seven thirty to eight thirty. Eight thirty is sick call. So we do eight thirty to uh, okay. When do we get eight thirty to ten is when we okay. call people in. No, I'm so sorry. Eight thirty to nine is when we write people's names down and get mm-hmm. people in for sick call. And then from eight thirty to ten, that's when we see all patients. Like all of the patients coming in for sick call, we mm-hmm. finish it. From ten to fourteen, we see our regular scheduled appointments. Okay. And then sometime in between there, we will do like a shift, a lunch break shift. So that way it's continuous, but like we kind of like we'll take a break from each one. And then from 1430 to 1900, that's our time to go PT, to go do mm. 
Get your calls done, get used to collateral stuff, all that. And then Mm -hmm. from 1900 to the next day, you can go to your rack. Um, That is all if you're seeing patients. Now, if so, I was I'm a quad zero general duty corpsman, um, but I also was flight deck qualified. Um, And for a good period of time, I was one of the only flight deck qualified people. I think it was me and another um, our ABTs that we would shift out. Um, so I ended up standing the watch, um, every other day, but when flight ops are going on, um, well, actually, no matter what, when we're on deployment, someone needs to go stand up the flight deck in our BDS. So if that was your day, you would go stand duty and, and that would be from zero seven to 1830. You would be up there in the BDS. And then sometime down there, you'd call someone. You can go get a break, go do lunch, like all that stuff, and go take your break and stuff. But for the most part, you're standing watch up there. And I loved it because a lot of times, thankfully, nothing was going on. So I could <laughs> read my book. <laughs> so you can read books and, and do other stuff. Catch up, then... catch up on a lot of work. That I to <laughs> of course. I mean, <laughs> um so so how big what was like your your patient base on on the ship like uh, how many people you actually were serving as a whole so um ship's company it's around three three to four no three thousand three thousand okay Uh, when we're deployed it goes up to like twelve thousand wow it's a, lot, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge patient yeah. space, right? It's a lot of people. I could be over-exaggerated. Wow. I really could be, but I'm trying to do the math between all the squadrons and then the Desron, because there's there's a good good amount of squadron people. Then mm-hmm. we have civilians that do come on, contractors. Okay. And then we have um, just our Desron and our strike group. Wow. Yeah, it's a yeah, huge community. Um, it is I, like I mean, a floating city. Yeah, so it, that's about, you, t- you took the words from my from my mouth. Like I was about to say, like that's literally a floating city, city, mm-hmm. with everything that you need, like uh, to survive during X amount, you know, while they deploy, right? And you have all the amenities. Uh, you have you have a gym. You have like uh, where to actually. As, uh, you have your rooms. You have like uh, the shower hall. I don't know the mess hall, whatever you you name it. The patient stations. It, it is insane. I wish I wish I can actually go and, and see that one day. It, 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 it oh, seems it, it seems fun. It <laughs> is. It's um, and you know a lot of people don't know this, but like when we are in not in the yard period, but we when we are pulled into our home port, they mm-hmm. do offer for active duty to come tour the ship, or if you know anybody there, they are hundred percent willing to like show you around. Um, cause I would do that with some of my friends. I would mm-hmm. be like, Oh, this is the ship. Well, this is nice. where I work, all that stuff, you know? Um, mm-hmm. but a carrier is truly nothing like it is, it is so hard to explain. Cause that is a G it's, mm-hmm. it's a floating city. Like we have mm-hmm. four gyms, we have so many birthings, we have mm-hmm. a ship store. Um, my coworkers make fun of me for this because they always bring this up because um, they're all FMF um, corpsmen. <laughs> but we did have a Starbucks <laughs> on okay. the trip. And it was called the Buck Stop. And that's where it was actually a, a watch duty. Like if you went cranking, um, you would stand that duty. But I will say with that one, we ran out of coffee like three months in to the deployment. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was like just sugar and milk. <laughs> So where, where's the where's the logistics officer at, man? Like you need to keep um, bringing out the coffee, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and I'm saying because I'm a logistics officer myself, so <laughs> that shouldn't be happening. <laughs> we, we need to have the serious conversation with the logistics officer about yeah, the coffee. Like, why is the coffee not the sugar? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's crazy um now uh, i saw your in your bio and i'm gonna go back a little bit so in 2021 uh, you were uh, selected to support the ferry fire fan- firefighting school as the smo and you actually uh qualify over 200 personnel in basic firefighting can you actually speak about that experience oh yeah so this was i'm <laughs> At the time, my DLCPO, he was amazing. Um, 
he recently passed away, but I don't want to, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, he was so amazing and he selected me. He was like, Hey, there's a HM1 that wants to go on leave. Like needs to go on emergency. Mm -hmm. leave. Um, do you want to go TAD and stand in his place as a corpsman? All you're going to do is sign paperwork and just be present <laughs> because they can't do operations without a corpsman there. And I was like, uh, heck yeah, <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> um, I was an E3 at the time. Um, and plus that got me out of an underway. We were, we were doing workups at that time. So I was like, wake up at 5 a.m. every day and go do these trains or go on an underway. <laughs> and I chose that one. Um, so I went there and it was so amazing. I got red coveralls. Um, those are like, um, for those that are not Navy or never been on a ship, those are like your uh, flying squad coveralls and you have to qualify. And it was really big on me because I tried so hard to qualify to be flying squad. Um, but I kept getting told no because I was medical. So, and I only wanted to do it for the red coveralls. That was strictly like just for those color coveralls. So when I got them, I was like, oh my God, he -he. <laughs> I get to <laughs> had my little moment um so when working there was such a blast though like I was able to I think this part too also really showed me like I genuinely enjoyed the navy as a whole rather than just being a corpsman and you know doing medicine but I loved it as a whole because doing the firefighting stuff <laughs> like mm -hmm. watching the ins and outs of like damage control and stuff like it was just amazing like, it was so cool. And then seeing all of them, like, the instructors teach and get so passionate about it. And then, like, all of these other uh, ships um, and students qualifying and, like, learning. It was just so cool. Like, and then I got to stand in for some of them because I was just like, I want to see. Can I, like, come in and watch? And, like, can I qualify? Can mm -hmm. I do stuff? And they, they, like, let me go in and watch and do all that stuff. And... It was so cool. I loved it. And I it, they were all E5s and E6s and Chiefs. So I learned a lot from them in the Navy and as a whole on how to be like just mentorship and leadership. And so it was just such an eye-opening thing. Um, and it was so fun. And qualifying like to all the amount of people, uh, that was... I didn't really realize how much of an impact it was until um, looking into a lot of uh, what my senior chief, my DLCPO, had said. He's like, do you not realize what you did over there? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and then he, like, broke it down for me. But it was also, um, and I'm glad I went because they didn't have a CPR instructor or a BLS instructor. And I've been an instructor for, like, for a minute now so when I went over there I was like oh well I can just assist you guys with stuff if you need it and they just like their minds were blown so I was happy I could provide more help and service for them than just doing my day-to-day -day job yeah and, and it sounds again fun that you had a lot of fun like by by doing so with the firefighters you, and now we mentioned we mentioned you mentioned that when you promoted to E4, it was a big achievement, achievement for you, and then you have to wait for it for so long. What about when you promoted to, to E5? How, how, how was that for you? And then when that happened in your career, at, at what location? So um, I was an E4, E3 for four years, and I was an mm -hmm. E4 for one year. Mm, okay. So after a year, I picked up E5 <laughs> off the exam. Mm -hmm. I When I picked up E5, I'm not going to I'm not going to say I didn't work for it. I did. I studied really hard. Mm -hmm. I had got my associates and I knew I had award points and okay. I came in with the transfer. I came in with a, a ranked eval of an EP. So I knew I had some chance. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting <laughs> at all to pick up an E5 um, my second time around as a corpsman just because of our quotas. Our quotas are really low so I really was not expecting it um and coming from a ship I knew I was working at a second class level there and so I was like yeah I'm so ready to be an E5 I'm so ready to be like an HM2 mm -hmm. I, knew, I know what I'm gonna do right mm -hmm. 
And coming, tra- when I picked up E5 here at my current command, mm-hmm. it was such a shock to, to me mm-hmm. because lucky for me, I work with a lot of, um, I don't want to say like, saying calling them seasoned second classes <laughs> sounds like so bad, but um, a lot of like, people who've been in longer than me I because I, I just hit my six year mark in October so mm-hmm. I'm still a baby in the Navy mm-hmm. I think I'm still a baby in the Navy um so lucky that when I picked up second class here and I'm, I'm around like people who've been in for 10 years 13 years they're still E5s because our quota is just they our quotas are just horrible they happen forever um I, when I, because of those people to mentor me and assist me and everything, it's helped me a lot Mm -hmm. growing as a sailor, growing as a leader, because it's easy to see the rank and see the, the position, right? And think, yeah, that's so easy. I can do it. Right. But then when you pull that and you put it on yourself, it's so much different and then you start realizing and you start seeing like oh I can't just say I'm just knee four I'm just knee three anymore (laughs) like I don't know I have to you know have a plan 24 7 and something to say so um picking up e5 was definitely I'm not gonna say it wasn't an achievement it was a surprise to me and I'm proud of it I was not expecting it. So I think that's what makes it a little bit more of a, something to be proud of. <laughs> no, but, I, 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 yeah. of course it, it's proud. Like, again, you're working hard and regardless of time and service, um, I think what you put into work is what's going to pay da- dividends at the end. Um, and you mentioned that you got your associates and then I think you, do you finish your, your bachelor's already? Is that much? I, We'll get my bachelor's on December twelfth. Ah, uh, congratulations! And <laughs> and all all of this, all of this while wor- while working, right? So, can you actually yeah. how you balance studying and working, and then what type of advice you can give for those that are in your same shoes right now, or looking to actually start a, you know, like a higher education while working? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um. Let me try to figure out how I want to say this. <laughs> I kind of did the psychotic method where I have zero patients, and mm-hmm. I would I knew I was so close to getting my bachelor's. And mm-hmm. if I I could see it, like I in my brain, I was like, okay, if I do this, I will get it by like next year, and mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about anything, right? Um, so I went to school full time on top of working full time. And I don't recommend that because mm-hmm. burnout is real and mm-hmm. I'm at a short command and I should not be feeling burnout at all. Mm-hmm. Um, now, with that being said, doing that, so like taking four class, because what did I do? I took, I took five classes each semester and the summer I took six classes. Mm-hmm. And then this last semester, I dedicated this one to just one class and it's my capstone. But I did literally, I piled on all of my classes and I did all that. Um, With that being said, doing that on top of working full time, and I'm not just saying like just doing your basic job. I, cause I didn't just do my basic job. I held programs and collaterals and I'm a part of associations and I'm a part of command collaterals. So uh, doing those on top of full time school, you are going to be overwhelmed. But my Mm -hmm. biggest thing is time management. <clears throat> because during all of this, I still made time for my personal life. I still made time to go hang out with friends. I still made time to physically and men- like, dedicate time for my physical health and my mental health. So mm-hmm. if you are going to do that, time manage better. Mm-hmm. Also, if you're going to do exactly <laughs> what I did, don't just assume you're not going to benefit from it because um doing all of that, I did get nominated for uh I not only nominated but I won a sailor of the quarter, which nice. I'm, Congrats. I'm, a, I'm I think it's the equivalent of like soldiers of the quarter so, like yeah. quarter, yeah. yeah so yeah, similar. <laughs> 
that which that was my first ever board I ever went up to and mm -hmm. learned that I cannot do facing movements to save the life of me. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, but if you are going to do that, my biggest recommendation is time management. Um, sitting down, actually investing in a planner and going through like, okay, I'm going to do this this day, but then mm -hmm. look at it. I also dedicated all of my work. I'm doing that at work. Like that is during my working hours. Now, if I want to come in early, an hour early, that's fine, whatever. But everything past work, that is for school. And I usually dedicated my Saturdays, like my Sundays, like during the daytime for school. Um, and I kind of took that as like, and I, I made it fun with it where I wouldn't stay at home. Um, I would go to usually like a coffee shop around DC or something mm -hmm. like that, somewhere new. So kind of like I, I, I did make things. I incorporated it to make it fun for me, at least. <laughs> like of course, I, I do all that because yeah yeah no and and i concur with your words uh time management is a huge a huge one um and for those that actually want to continue to work and study at the same time it's possible um but just find those white spaces that you can actually incorporate some some higher education especially like if you want to do the do this as a career, like any branch, I mean, you're going to stay 20 years and you have your ambitions of promoting to certain levels. Um, I mean, it's okay, but some other uh, people join the, 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 the military branches just to do three years, four years, and then, you know, get the most out of it and then just and jump the civilian sector. Um, but again, this goes back to the time management. There's a, a lot of online online universities now um they offer like uh special accommodations for military members i know for a fact that the american military university uh, is one of them um and then the ta pays for it so you don't you don't even have to pay, pay out of your pocket because we we get every service member four thousand dollars a year to spend in something that you want to learn like a craft you, if you want to be a pilot i think that you can actually learn how to be a pilot and they are and the dod pays for it um, yeah. But again, you you selected the hard route. It sounds like that you wanted to go like full time both, which I mean, I respect <laughs> too. I don't recommend it like, to anybody. <laughs> like I promise, um, because I I would cut like there are days I would just come into work mm -hmm. and I'd straight up like try. I'm like, what what do you guys want? Like what? Like if, it's, if it's not to do with work, I can't. I can't function. No, no, like, no. And and, um, and I just I just finished my grad school. I like recently. Congratulations! I thank you. Like um, my commencement is going to be in December now, but I I graduated in August. Uh, but it was paid fully by the army, and I was a full time student here at VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. And I had to, I have time to not, not working. I mean, I, I'm not, I was not working. I was like full student status paid by the army, focusing on my uh, full-time uh, masters. And I can imagine doing that like full-time and working at the same time. I was like, respect for to you, kudos, because like, I was like, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> yeah. And then I start my masters in the spring next year. I may give myself a month. Oh, okay. But you're gonna go full time too? Are you gonna go full time? Oh, definitely not. Not for my master. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I will yourself, definitely yeah. take. <laughs> well, because TA only pays for half of it. Half, yeah. Um, and then you you pay the rest, unless it's a yellow ribbon school, and then maybe you can like talk to the people there. But yeah. for the most part, it's it's gonna be out of the half of it's gonna be out of you. So, right. and that one, I'm I've. I, I gotta work. <laughs> like I gotta yeah, sure. work. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> like um, I'm probably just gonna take it really easy with like one class. Okay. That's I like, mean, no rush, no rush. Just take one <laughs> class at a time, and then like uh, focus in in the class, and then move on. Now, in your current um, duty station, uh, you have some roles like the S A F P R victim advocate and vice president of the second class petty officer association. How this role allow you? And we 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 hear that you like full time status in in, in your studies, etc. But how does this roles allow you to make a difference both 
in your command and in the community with those roles? So for Sapper, um, mm. sexual assault prevention and response, mm. I'm a, not only a victim advocate, but I am an administrative victim advocate. Mm -hmm. And I am um, an assistant and program manager with Quantico. Mm -hmm. It's me and a chief, chief player um, out there. With that one, it is not hard at all. I have such a passion and um, for Sapper. I, it is one of the command, it, one of the things in the Navy that I am extremely passionate about and mm -hmm. I enjoy helping um, survivors and I enjoy helping support them and make mm -hmm. their cheer choices and make a difference within their lives to help them. So I, with that, I have, it does not affect me with my full-time student, full-time work does not at all affect me on that because I just enjoy it. Um, as a command impact, I'm supporting <laughs> survivors. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks right. for itself with my actions mm -hmm. and my roles. Now for vice president for second class petty officer association, I would not be able to do my job and I would not be able to do anything in that association without my amazing team. So the president, mm -hmm. secretary, treasurer, PAO, um, I'm just so happy to have such a great cabinet team as well as members in the association themselves who are there constantly coming up with amazing ideas and just like supporting me when I have great ideas. So it's, we all just work so great as a team, building morale and building community involvement within our command itself. So I, those, uh, I, for that one, I, I just would not be able to do anything without my team. Your backbone with your team, basically. Um, no, no, it's, 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 it sounds amazing. And again, like you, you have a lot on your plate, which uh, again, kudos to you that you're, it looks like super busy, uh, but striving for great, for greatness, like as always. Right now, um, let's talk about Anso and, and you are, as the community engagement chair for the national capital region chapter, you have spearheaded number of volunteer and social events. What drive your passion for community engagement and how ANSO help you grow personally and professionally? ANSO, okay. So let me take this back to mm -hmm. 2023. Yeah? Yeah, last year. Mm -hmm. I went to the Eastern Symposium um, and I went there with, so my dad's active duty still. Um, mm -hmm. He had never heard of Anso ever in his career, like at all, until someone brought it up to him when he PCS over at the Pentagon, um, previous duty stations ago. So um, when he found out about it, he immediately called me. He's like, hey, have you heard of Anso? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, is it, what is that? Is that like a program? Is that, what is it? And he was like, no, it's the Association of Naval Service Officers. Um, it's for um, the Hispanic community, essentially, like making us leaders. And he's like, I, I'm gonna put in a TAD thing. I think you should too. And you should see it because it's in Norfolk. You're stationed in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I was like, is there any paper, like an admin, anything to support? He's like, yeah, they just dropped an av admin. So I found it up, I routed the chit. Uh, my chain of command was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I just I just found out about it, but there's a nav admin and it's in Norfolk. Can I go? <laughs> and I'm like, sure, sure, you can go TAD. Um I think uh I I I going there impacted my career so hard. Um mm -hmm. because I I was still on kind of a threshold of if I wanted to stay in the Navy or okay. not. Um, going into this, so going to the symposium mm. impacted me so hard because I had never met that amount, those, that amount of mentorship. I had never had gotten that. I never spent in a room full of, full of leaders with 
so like similar experiences that I've had just as a junior sailor right then. And then them being like, no, I had the exact same thing happen to me. This is how I moved from it. This is how I grew. So being a sponge and soaking up all of that, it was just so amazing to me. Um, being in rooms with like a vice admiral or admirals in general, like as an E4, I was like, what? This is so crazy. Meeting the secretary of the Navy um, and then gaining just a lot, a lot of knowledge and just hearing a lot of stories from my own community um, because I am Venezuelan. And there's, there's not a lot of Venezuelans in, like, in the, well, in my area that I grew up in, but in the military as well, like, I don't see them. So meeting people who are and knowing where they're from, because I used to live there and mm -hmm. seeing all that, I was just like, that is so crazy. Mm -hmm. It's so, like, it was just, um, and so just kind of motivated me, essentially, and reminded me of why I joined and, remind in at that time just overall kind of like was a firm like the final decision for me to stay to stay in the navy um and then coming to the dc chapter and being the community engagement coordinator it really like motivated me that and kind of also reminded me that i am a leader and i can be a leader and anytime i have doubts that i am <laughs> I feel like I suck <laughs> or I'm just like having imposter syndrome or whatever or like oh, I don't really feel like I deserve to be in this like place um the team Captain Santiago, Lieutenant Benitez, Staff Sergeant uh Mays like they're always there to remind yeah. me. Yes, I am Maze. Oh, but like, <laughs> oh, Maze. <laughs> oh, I love her. Don't <laughs> Melanie is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. So, like, they're always there to remind me and to always be my biggest cheerleaders. And having this community and this family always available and always there and seeing things, even when I don't see things, it's it's helped me a lot. <laughs> it builds confidence as a leader and just, like, where I'm at in my career. No, most definitely. Uh, we can hear all but good stuff about Anson, how Anson helped shape your career and, and continue. The biggest thing about uh, Anson is like the mentorship is one of the huge ones. And, and now every time they, they do the symposium, um, junior enlisted and officers can, because now remember, let's remember that Anson is all inclusive. No matter if you're officer or enlisted, um, now they're expanding the reach not only for the sea services, that they're trying to expand the reach to other uh, military branches like the Air Force and the Army. Um, because like, I'm a soldier and I'm just helping them like do this podcast. And um, we last time, I, yeah, last time I was the only yeah. soldier in the, in the Eastern Symposium, uh, Joint Symposium with the NNOA. I was the only soldier and I was like, hey, that uniform is weird. Like, where you coming from like people were asking me it was like yeah i'm a soldier oh, okay <laughs> it was fun uh to hear that but uh i'm glad that works it out any any other big projects from the dc chapter you want to share uh from the answer community if any um so right now we've been working a lot with njrtcs mm -hmm. yesterday i did um me and captain santiago we went out there and i provided medical coverage and he was a judge um over for their for their um I'm sorry, I'm like rambling, um, for their physical fitness event. I was never an NJRTC, so I'm probably going to butcher the names of these events, but they just did like their whole physical fitness mm -hmm. uh, event with, I guess, like 14 schools in the Potomac okay. County, and that was so fun. It was so nice. cool. Um I was able to bring along a couple of my sailors from Quantico um, just to give them some volunteer oh, wow. hours. Um, and then I brought along one of, I like roped in one of my good friends and my provider. Um, I roped her <laughs> into coming with me. So we were able to do a lot more with medicine out there if that was needed. But it was, I learned a lot about JRTC in general, which is something I, I actually enjoy going out and reaching 
to high schoolers and like the community and trying to like mm-hmm. share my story, share other people's story and give some advice, mentorship. Cause if you are going to join the military, I don't want um like f- fake expectations right. to be planted in your head. Like um, I want you to know, like I want kids to know like the full picture of things. No, Obviously, no, not yeah. biased, but yeah. <laughs> the effort, like for that you mentioned that, um, it, and which we, we are in this subject, and we are about to to wrap up our podcast, and appreciate uh, Alexa to being here to, today with us um, on the Answer Podcast. What will what advice will you give to anyone that actually is looking to join any of the military branches, and they're listening right now, and they don't know anything about any military branches? Like they're going, they're they're about to join. They're about to go out, ship out. They, oh, they they're trying to find more information and how to join. Like, what, what would what would advice do you do to give them? Like, hey, uh, look for a mentorship. Look some by somebody that is in the service. Ask questions. Those type of uh, advice. Okay. Well, biggest thing is like always bring someone with you to mm-hmm. the recruiting station. Okay. Um, Especially if you're so young, I would always bring someone that you knew that Mm -hmm. was prior service or was service. So you you don't get roped into being like undesignated or in Mm -hmm. no offense to any HTs, but like (laughs) dealing with any like things with plumbing, like you don't Mm want to do that. Um, But overall, just the biggest thing that my biggest advice for anyone and anybody that is going to be in a like a new like in their workspace or joining the military is bloom where you're planted so when you join the navy and i'm gonna always speak about the navy because that's all i know Mm -hmm. um Uh so there are only two things you have full control over and that's your prt and that is your advancement exam Everything else you do not have control over, like picking your duty station, um, picking the workplace you go to, picking the environment you're in. You don't get a choice. So when I say bloom where you're planted, bloom where you're planted. You grow from that. So in those like those things that you can't choose, you just thrive. So you can thrive through that from your mentality and how you perceive yourself and how you perceive others always come in there with a positive attitude Mm -hmm. always give off what you expect so if you expect respect you give respect i'm a big believer of of respect is earned not given so if you're gonna (laughs) prove to me that you are um going to be a leader you're gonna like you want those positions prove yourself i want to see at impact i want to see um you putting in the work for it now work ethic always having a great work ethic with that and that all that all ties in with bloom where you're planted in Mm -hmm. order to be the best version of yourself in those stuff especially things that you can't control and that's something i really wish i would have um figured out a lot Mm -hmm. earlier on in my career and not within the last two to three years (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah most definitely you know so like i mentioned before like some some uh s- some people join the army or the the military with a goal in the mindset like they like i want to actually retire out of the military or some people like they don't know what they're looking for they're just like hey i just want to get out of my hometown because there's nothing to do uh and i want to try this for a couple of years but whatever you do before you go and sign any paper, just uh, ask for advice, uh, look for somebody that into the service, or even you can actually uh, ask, ask us here in the, in the answer. Um, if you want to know more information about any other branches uh, or even Navy, the sea services, just drop your comment below and we will get back to you. Or you can actually find us at answermail.org um, and then you can actually reach out, uh, send an email to us and we can get back to you. Uh, Alexa, so as we closing now, well, so what's next for you and how are you preparing for your any uh, the next phase of your career? What's next for Alexa? What do you think is um, next? Uh, so I get my bachelor's uh, next month and then mm-hmm. I'm going and it's in history uh so then i'll eventually start working on my master's in education mm-hmm. um as for career wise i have a couple of things that i'm thinking about doing mm-hmm. um i do pick orders 
next year. So I'm trying to mm-hmm. figure out what's next for career progression. Gotcha. So I've bounced around the ideas of becoming, you know, officer. I bounced around the ideas of maybe I want to do 10 years and like then transfer over as like reservist and mm. do some contracting and things. Um, but I know for sure right now, what I really want to do is career counseling. Um, that's something I'm super interested in and it matches up a lot with my career plan, mm-hmm. um, with my degree, I'm sorry, my degree plan <laughs> for afterwards, which is education. So I've been looking into that. I've been looking into RDC, a school instructor, stuff like that. Cause I do like teaching and I like instructing and mentoring. I, I, I enjoy all of those things. So trying to find that. Nice. But then, yeah, hopefully uh, it's, it's, it sounds good. I know you, you're going to do well. Um, sounds like a, you're very eager to continue progressing and uh, even in your career or professional or your personal life. I know you're going to strive for greatness. And again, you like Betty and Cage with multi, multiple affinity groups, including Anso uh, on this case. Um, now, are, are you going to the next symposium, my ass, or are not planning to, or you cannot go to the Western symposium? I unfortunately cannot go. Um... So the nav admin dropped a little bit too late for me to mm. route it toward my command. And we have a holiday block leave. So it's during mm. then because I'm all the way in DC and the symposiums in San Diego. In San it's a little bit, and, and it's a little bit out of my price range to mm. pay out of my own pocket to go during the holidays, especially. Mm. Um, so I will not be attending, unfortunately. Um, sure. I am going to try to attend the Eastern Symposium because I ha- didn't get to do that this year because I was uh, I had family leave, but I want to try to go next year. No, no, most most definitely no. And and again, we're gonna offer uh, some some of the materials online. Um, I'll be covering part of the symposium. Uh, I'm gonna on third December, which is the Marine Corps Day. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a live on YouTube. So for those that are interested to see what's going on on the symposium, stay tuned on the YouTube, uh, channel for the answer, uh, because we're going to be, um, live and then we're going to have some more interviews with some of the, our D's and then with the actual, com- uh, you know, guest speakers, etc. So it's going to be fun for the Western region. Uh, I'll be there. So. I'll see you then, uh, the next one on the Eastern uh, Symposium, that's for sure, Alexa. Well, uh, any any last words before we close out today's podcast um, for the audience as a general? Um, I I think we covered everything. Listen, mm-hmm. I could yap all day. <laughs> like, that's my favorite pastime, so let's not keep it going. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me on here. And I want to thank uh, my amazing leadership in the DC mm-hmm. chapter, specifically like Captain Santiago, Lieutenant Commander Montalvo, um, Lieutenant Benitez, Staff Sergeant Melanie Mays. <laughs> like, we nice. already said love her <laughs> yeah um and just like everybody as a whole they're always helping me and then getting me to be where i am now because i was not expecting this at all um and i'm so entirely grateful to have the representation and the yeah. reward <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, uh, HM2 Valerio, appreciate it for being here tonight, uh, today with the podcast. And I'm going to wrap up. Rob. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today and I share your incredible journey. Uh, your story is a testament to the power of resilience, leadership, and importance of the community. Again, thank you to HM2 Valerio to be in, uh, today in the answer podcast. To our listener, don't forget to stay connected with Anso uh, on social media. Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn as Anso Mill and YouTube uh, for updates and events, news, and more. And do not miss the upcoming Anso Western Region Leadership Symposium from December the 2nd to the 6th, 2024 at MCIS uh, Miramar in San Diego, California. It's an event packed with opportunities to grow, network, and lead. Visit www.ansomill.org uh, to register today. Uh, finally, a big thank you to the Navy Mutual for sponsoring today's episode and supporting our mission of uplift, uplifting the voices of the Naval Service members. This is Captain Manuel Calo, your host of the Answer Podcast. Stay committed to service, leadership, and growth. I'll see you next time. Let's go, mi gente.